Welcome to the Capital News. I'm your host, Alex Kreitis. Today is Monday, September 6, 2021. Thank you so much for joining me. My apologies. It's been way too long. I understand, believe me when I tell you, just been pretty busy at work. Crazy schedule, to put it lightly, but I'm hoping that that schedule will start to calm down here over the remaining months of the year, which will allow me to hopefully get back on track to posting at least a few podcasts a week. I'm not going to make any promises, but that is my goal. At least do something on the weekend, so we'll just play it by ear to see how I publish and what I do. Typically speaking, I do like to keep the podcast to about 30 minutes if I can. That seems to be right in the wheelhouse for to keep people's attention and to cover uh, enough of enough topics in depth to have a good conversation. So I don't know if I'll keep it to that or if I'll extend them and make them closer to 45 minutes or an hour and just cover more topics to at least get them out. And then you can listen to them as you want. You can break them up as you wish. But that's the case. And uh, I thank a lot of you out there for sticking with me, even though I have been away for the past month and a half. Uh, Nobody is more surprised than me when I look at my numbers on the various platforms that this podcast gets posted to, and they haven't they haven't hit rock bottom like I had expected. There's so you're either just continuing to get your capital news fix or people are looking because of so much going on and the audience is actually growing in some sense potentially and hopefully that's the optimistic outlook on it. But I just need to get out there publishing more because to put it lightly, it has been chaotic over the past month and a half. But the silver lining in that, at least the way that I'm trying to look at it for being away for the past month and a half is... This audience, especially those who have been with me for a while, you're not surprised by any of this. You're not surprised by the protests. You're not surprised by the debacle in Afghanistan. You're not surprised by the out-of-control spending bills and proposals that are being put forward in Congress. You're not surprised that the Federal Reserve continues to put the pedal to the metal and continues to increase their balance sheet on a week-by-week basis, continuously and constantly making all-time new highs, despite the warning signs, despite even some members of the Fed saying, yeah, we got to start putting the brakes on some of this stuff. No, it's full steam ahead as far as Jay Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, is concerned. So nobody should be surprised by any of this. You just haven't heard me talking about it for the past month and a half. But that's the value of this podcast. You've been prepared. More evidence of a stagflationary environment. Check, check, check. Title of today's podcast is just the August Jobs Report, because I just want to get back to our roots in reporting some of these bigger financial reports that we have traditionally gone over for the past year and a half. So that's why we're going to cover mainly today just the August Jobs Report. But we still have all of those other outstanding issues to contend with. But you've been prepared for this. You shouldn't be surprised by any of it, whether it's protests because people can't eat, because they can't find work, because prices keep going up, or if it's because of these draconian lockdown measures. I mean, if you look at countries like Australia and New Zealand and Canada, I mean, they're setting up to be Nazi Germany. And this is not conspiracy theory stuff. This is in the news. If you listen to the Australian media or the Canadian media, I mean, they're showing you these camps, which almost, I mean, they, they really do look like concentration camps the way they're building these buildings and basically saying, well, if you're unvaccinated or if you should happen to have COVID-19, this is where you're going because you're a public health threat to the rest of the population. I mean, this is absurd. It's ridiculous. Now, people are trying to stand up. People are trying to protest. In Australia, I believe there was a massive protest with the truckers in Australia who said, well, we're just, we're just all going on strike. We're not going to move anything. So that could, that could move the needle. That could maybe get the attention of some politicians. But in the interim, that's going to hurt a lot of people too because they can't get their goods and services because everything you touch pretty much comes from a truck. All right, so I don't want to go off on a tangent. We will cover these things in a later period because these, they're just getting started. It's only going to get worse from here, we have many dictators all over the place, and politicians and central bankers, they are going to continue to use COVID-19 as the excuse to justify the unjustifiable, and what's unjustifiable is everything that they have been doing. And then when we're done with that, 
And if the people push back enough and they got to go back on their heels, guess what's next? The climate. Because we always have to deal with the climate. There's always the environment around us. And now somehow central bankers are going to task themselves with being the geniuses and the scientists, I guess, who are going to fix global warming or climate change, however you want to phrase it. Because you've always got to contend with it. So that will always be the excuse for something else needs to be done. Oh, we have to continue to buy mortgage-backed securities because, I mean, look what's going on down in the south here in the United States. Look at, look at all of these hurricanes coming. I mean, it's massive. Look at all of the flooding that's going on in the south, in the northeast. I mean, look at it. Look at all the fires out west. I mean, we got to continue to buy this stuff up. Got to continue to throw liquidity into the system. What a joke that we have these discussions in the media, financial media mainly, about the Federal Reserve perhaps going to taper. They can't taper their balance sheet. Get the hell out of here. They can't increase interest rates. Not even close. We have almost $30 trillion in debt, and it's only going to get worse from here. They can't increase rates. They can't start tapering because we know we covered this two years ago. Started tapering back in 2018. How the markets couldn't handle it, how the economy couldn't handle it then. And then everybody thought it was the greatest economy ever. Of course, we didn't because I know what's going on. You can't pull the wool over my eyes with this stuff. I know how to get dirty with it. So, no. They couldn't do it then. No way on God's green earth they can do it now. They know this. They won't admit it. What happen is they're going to continue to put the pedal to the metal. They're going to continue to expand their balance sheet. They're going to continue to throw liquidity into the system until the system reaches exhaustion and it just collapses. That's what's going to happen. Because if they do taper, if they do increase interest rates or buts about it, that the markets will crater as will the economy. So those are their choices. We can just keep this asinine, criminal, immoral, un-American experiment going on, pedal to the metal. Or, or we can try to rein it in, even just a little bit, and that'll be the collapse. Either way, a massive collapse will be coming. Which, again, is not tinfoil hat conspiracy theory stuff. The Great Reset is real. They talk about it at the World Economic Forum. There are book booklets that they promote. Marketing material. You will own not like it. Well, look at what's going on. I mean, it kind of seems they're getting away with it. They got you locked down. You can't afford your rent. You can't afford your bills. Can't go to work. Dependent on the government to, st to, sp to send you, excuse me, stimulus checks. And of course, well, what a surprise. We're coming to that extra money being sent out through unemployment benefits. How is this all going to pan out? Not too well in my estimation. And as I have been saying here, we don't have time to get into it, but when we look at retail sales, well, no stimulus check, no retail sales. Well, what a surprise. And several months ago, when you were looking at these macro economic data points, and we were talking about the savings rates, and everybody was saying, oh my goodness, this is going to be the greatest recovery ever. Because look at the savings rate. Look how much money Americans have in their bank accounts, finally. Of course, that was all courtesy of Uncle Sam and the Federal Reserve printing it. Not because of productivity gains. Not because people were actually working. And now if you look today where that savings rate is, oh, well, we're back to normal, folks. It's a negative savings rate, meaning people are broke. So we went through that real quick, didn't we? Why? Because prices went up. So all of that free money... Wasn't so free, was it? Which the Capitol News has been all over, even before the Nobody Cares Act 1.0 was passed. It's not a difficult task to see what's going on. You just have to think for yourself. You can't allow these idiots in the news media, in Washington, D.C., in New York City, or wherever else these talking heads come from, you cannot allow them to do your thinking for you. You have to think for yourself. You can read, you can write, you can do arithmetic, you can do all this stuff. You don't need to be a scientist to look at the data. You don't need to be a mathematician 
to manipulate the data and to look it up and say, okay, well, this percentage of blah, blah, blah. You don't need to be an economist to look at these data points. You need common sense and you can teach yourself so much. And it's just about taking the time to do it. Deep breath. Pause. Does this make sense? If this variable moves, how is it going to affect this one? How would I expect it to behave? Did it behave that way? Okay, well, then that makes sense. If it didn't, well, why didn't it? Was there something else also pushing on that other variable? And maybe that makes sense. Or maybe I'm being lied to. Maybe something else is going on here. That's all you got to do. Ask questions. Think for yourself. And question me. But I have a pretty good track record. And as I stated, haven't been here for a month and a half. But you shouldn't be surprised by anything that is unfolding right now. But as I said, today's podcast is August jobs report. So let's get to that. The employment situation, August 2021 out of the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Total non-farm payroll employment rose by 235,000 in August, and the unemployment rate declined by 0.2 percentage points to 5.2% for the month of August. So far this year, monthly job growth has averaged 586,000. In August, notable job gains occurred in professional and business services, transportation and warehousing, private education, manufacturing, and other services. Employment in retail trade declined over the month. First to the household survey data. The unemployment rate declined by 0.2 percentage points to 5.2% in August. The number of unemployed persons edged down to 8.4 million following a large decrease in the month of July. Both measures are down considerably from their highs at the end of the February through April 2020 recession. And that's another thing I want to talk about. A podcast coming out soon is going to be called The Shortest Recession Ever which, of course, is just not true at all. We are, we are in the Greatest Depression. But back to where we were. However, they remain above their levels prior to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic at 3.5% and 5.7 million, respectively, in February of 2020. Among the major worker groups, the unemployment rate for adult men at 5.1% and whites 4.5% declined in August, while the rate for teenagers 11.2% increased. The jobless rates for adult women at 4.8%, blacks 8.8%, Asians 4.6%, and Hispanics at 6.4% showed little change over the month. Among the unemployed, the number of permanent job losers declined by 443,000 to 2.5 million in August, but remains 1.2 million higher than in the month of February of 2020. Now, this is the number that we like to look at to see what's going on long term, to see what is structural as opposed to sort of just transitory. And I don't like to use that word because it's been used too much now. But that number is going down. That's what we want to see. But we are still, again, 1.2 million higher than we were in February of 2020, again, for the number of permanent job losers. The number of persons on temporary layoff at 1.3 million was essentially unchanged in August. This measure is down considerably from the high of 18 million in April of 2020, but is 502,000 above the February 2020 level. The number of re-entrants to the labor force increased by 200,000 in August to 2.5 million. Re-entrants are persons who previously worked but were not in the labor force prior to beginning their job search. And another side note on all of this, this is a dismal number. This is a terrible number. Market expectations were 720, 730,000. But I will say this, and I obviously I don't give a lot of weight to the ADP report, which we would typically discuss briefly as well. But this is the first time in recent memory where the ADP report was relatively close to the official jobs report. And usually there's just a huge void in between them. And even the ADP number was a huge miss because people were, again, were anticipating 700 and some thousand. And it came in, at, I believe, 330,000 maybe was the ADP report. So a lot closer this time, but still a lot of weakness in the labor market, again, feeding into the stagflationary environment. All right. So the number of long term unemployed. Those jobless for 27 weeks or more decreased by 246,000 in August to 3.2 million, but is 2.1 million higher than in February of 2020. These long-term unemployed accounted for 37.4% of the total unemployed in August. That's, that's too high. 
The number of persons jobless less than five weeks at 2.1 million was little changed. I mean, you understand why 37.5% is too high. The longer you remain out of the workforce, the harder it is to get back into it. And again, long-term unemployed, those jobless for 27 weeks or more represents 37.4% of the total. That number has to come down if there's ever going to be any type of recovery that is sustained. Because people's skills atrophy, employers look at you and say, well, why have you, I mean, they might understand in this environment why you have been unemployed, but still, there might still be something amiss. What's going on here? The labor force participation rate at 61.7% in August was unchanged over the month and has remained within a narrow range of 61.4% to 61.7% since June of 2020. The participation rate is 1.6 percentage points lower than in February of 2020. The unemployment, or excuse me, the employment population ratio at 58.5% was little changed in August. This measure is up from its low of 51.3% in April of 2020, but remains below the figure of 61.1% in February of 2020. So even though we're only a few percentage points away from getting back to that February 2020 number, a few percentage points, that is a lot of ground to cover. And these are the metrics we like to go into a little bit deeper. And I typically have another podcast on this by itself or in tandem with another to dig deeper into the labor force participation rate to provide that historical context as well as with the employment population ratio and some other employment and labor statistics. So these numbers, despite some of the other good news, these are really the broader measures. And the fact that they haven't moved, these are the real barometers as far as I'm concerned. These ones give me more information and I can do better analysis as far as I'm concerned with these figures than I can just looking at the headline number and some other numbers that we already covered. So the fact that these numbers remain stubborn where they are now tells me that there is still a lot of weakness in the labor market. And of course, with this terrible number at 235,000, you have all these market analysts and politicians and central bankers coming out and saying, oh, well, guess what? September is probably going to be even worse. They're setting the stage. And of course, this gives more cover now on an economic basis as opposed to COVID or the climate for the Federal Reserve and other central banks to continue to keep the pedal to the metal. Oh, we can't taper because one of our mandates or part of our dual mandate here is full employment. Well, if the number is only 235,000, we have a long way to go. So we can't taper. See how it always has to fit the narrative? This gives them cover. In August, the number of persons employed part-time for economic reasons at 4.5 million was essentially unchanged. There were 4.4 million persons in this category in February of 2020. These individuals who would have preferred full-time employment were working part-time because their hours had been reduced or they were unable to find full-time jobs. The number of persons not in the labor force who currently want a job declined by 835,000 in August to 5.7 million, but remains higher than the level in February of 2020, which stood at 5 million. These individuals were not counted as unemployed because they were not actively looking for work during the last four weeks or or were unavailable to take a job, of course, th- that's one of the most ridiculous things that exists within this report. Yeah, we're unemployed, but you don't fall within the definition of unemployed, so you're not working, but we're not going to count you as such. It- it- it's ridiculous, but that's government at its finest. Among those not in the labor force who wanted a job, the number of persons marginally attached to the labor force at $1.6 million in August decreased by 295000 over the month. These individuals wanted and were available for work and had looked for a job sometime in the prior 12 months but had not looked for work in the four weeks preceding the surveys. The number of discouraged workers, a subset of the marginally attached, who believed that no jobs were available for them, was at 392000 in the month of August, down by 115000 from the previous month. Now some of the household survey supplemental data. In August, 13.4% of employed persons teleworked because of the coronavirus pandemic. Little changed from the prior month. So for those of you who are very interested to see what happens moving forward as to whether or not corporate um, real estate will bounce back, if people are going to go back to the office, or if this is going to be something that becomes a little bit more permanent or quasi-permanent, this is the number you want to pay attention to. So again, in August, 13.4% of employed persons telework because of the coronavirus pandemic, little changed from the prior month. 
These data refer to employed persons who teleworked or worked at home for pay at some point in the, pa- in the last four weeks, specifically because of the pandemic. In August, 5.6 million persons reported that they had been unable to work because their employer closed or lost business due to the pandemic. That is, they did not work at all or worked fewer hours at some point in the last four weeks due to the pandemic. Let me repeat this. In August, 5.6 million persons reported that they had been unable to work because their employer closed or lost business due to the pandemic. Well, I thought this was a miraculous recovery. I thought this was great. I thought the stock market hitting all time was indicative of all these businesses opening back up. No, not even close. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all a mirage with inflated money printing. End of story. This measure is up from 5.2 million in July. It's up from 5.2 million in July. Means getting worse. Among those who reported in August that they were unable to work because of pandemic-related closures or lost business, 13.9% received at least some pay from their employer for the hours not worked, up from 9.1% in the prior month. Well, at least they're getting paid a little bit more than the prior month. Among those not in the labor force in August, stands at 1.5 million persons, were prevented from looking for work due to the pandemic little changed from July. To be counted as unemployed by definition, individuals must be either actively looking for work or on temporary layoff. On to the establishment survey data. Total non-farm payroll employment rose by 235,000 in August, following increases of 1.1 million in July and 962,000 in June. Non-farm employment has risen by 17 million since April of 2020 but is down by 5.3 million or 3.5% from its pre-pandemic level in February of 2020. So that fact, as I just stated previously, is what the Federal Reserve is going to continue to look at very closely and continue to point out to the rest of us that because that number is still well above where we were pre-pandemic, we cannot begin to taper on with any serious degree. This gives them a lot of wiggle room as far as they're concerned. So pay attention to those numbers. In August, notable job gains occurred in professional and business services, transportation and warehousing, private education, manufacturing, and other services. Employment in retail trade declined over the month. Employment in professional and business services increased by 74,000 in August. Employment rose in architectural and engineering services up 19,000. Computer systems design and related services up 10,000. Scientific research and development services up 7,000. And office administrative services up 6,000. Since February of 2020, employment in professional and business services is down by 468,000, over half of which is in temporary help services, down 260. 2,000. Still a ways to go. Transportation and warehousing added 53,000 jobs in August, bringing employment in the industry slightly above 22,000. It's pre, excuse me, it's pre-pandemic level in February of 2020. Employment gains have been led by strong growth in couriers and messengers and in warehousing and storage, which added 20,000 jobs each in August. This is just an Amazon world and we're just all living in it. Air transportation also added jobs, up 11,000, while transit and ground passenger transportation, which includes school buses, lost jobs, down 8,000. In August, employment increased by 40,000 in private education, declined by 21,000 in state government education, and changed little in local government education, down 6,000. In all three industries, these employment changes followed job gains in June and July. August marks the beginning of the traditional back-to-school season. However, recent employment changes are challenging to interpret as pandemic-related staffing fluctuations in public and private education have distorted the normal seasonal hiring and layoff patterns. Since February of 2020, employment is down by 159,000 in private education, by 186,000 in state government education, and by 220,000 in local government education. Now, this is another interesting thing to pay attention to with these schools, because depending on where you are, your school districts, your school boards, what they are attempting to mandate with respect to COVID-19, whether these kids have to be vaccinated or whether they have to wear masks, whether they have to do social distancing, whatever they are trying to implement, 
you know, how is this going to affect these various school districts? Because a lot of parents may be perfectly fine with sending their children to school to wear a mask all day, while there may be a lot of parents who don't want their children wearing a mask all day. So if that's the case, uh, you got to live by the rules. Well, then they're going to take their kids out of public education by chance and put them into private schools. So we're going to see a lot of shifts, a lot of movement back and forth here when it comes to education. How many kids might just be homeschooled because parents are pulling them out and saying, oh, I, I can't, maybe I can't afford private school, but there's no way I'm sending them to public school because I, I don't want them wearing a mask all day or having to be vaccinated or whatever the case might be. They're just going to stay at home. I'm going to teach them. So something to be very mindful of. This is going to have a long-term impact. And I'm not even talking about just maybe perhaps the, the social skills and anything else that these kids might start to lack or, or might be uh, slow to develop because they're behind a mask and everybody they're talking to is behind a mask. That cannot be a good thing. It just can't be, especially for really young kids. But I'll continue here. Manufacturing added 37,000 jobs in August with gains in motor vehicles and parts up 24,000 and fabricated metal products up 7,000. Employment in manufacturing is down by 378,000 from its pre-pandemic level in February of 2020. And now because manufacturing is such a uh, hot button topic, politically speaking, that's likely going to be another number that the Federal Reserve and others will look to to say, oh my goodness, there's still a lot of ground to make up in manufacturing, so we have to continue printing money. The other services industry added 37,000 jobs in the month of August, but employment is 189,000 lower than in February of 2020. In August, employment rose in personal and laundry services up 19,000, and in repair and maintenance up 9,000. Employment and information increased by 17,000 in August, reflecting a gain in data processing, hosting, and related services up 12,000. Employment and information is down by 150,000 since February of 2020, so still a ways to go. Employment in financial activities rose by 16,000 over the month, with most of the gain occurring in real estate up 11,000. Employment in financial activities is down by 29,000 since February of 2020. And speaking of real estate, something we like to monitor here very closely, and again, despite the fact that I have been away for a month and a half, well, no surprise to anybody here, hopefully, housing prices, real estate prices continue to make all-time highs. Case-Shiller Index continues to make all-time highs on various metrics. And we'll, I will cover that in a separate podcast. But this is what I said. You have all of this liquidity flooding into the system, and it's not would-be homebuyers, if you will. It's not individuals. It's not young couples buying up these houses. This is hedge funds. This is pension funds. This is BlackRock and Blackstone being gifted all of this money from Federal Reserve buying the mortgage-backed securities, thus giving them the cash to go out and then actually buy the real estate up as opposed to the mortgage-backed securities. Instead of holding the paper, they're actually holding the asset now, and they're going to rent it back to people. Again, the Great Reset. You will own nothing and like it. Because, as I've been stating here for the past couple of years, since this podcast has been online, we are going to see, and we will continue to see, a lot of distortions in various economic and financial variables. Well, we may see mortgage applications slip week over week, month over month. And one would assume, well, if that's slipping, then prices should be falling because there's obviously not a lot of demand. But prices keep going up. And it's because you don't need a mortgage. You don't need a mortgage application if you're buying the house in cash. You get it? We haven't ever seen any, we have never seen anything like this before. And of course, if you graph this against the Fed's balance sheet, their purchases of everything, so their balance sheet in total, or against their purchases of Uncle Sam's debt, or of mortgage-backed securities, you can clearly see the relationship here. And if they want to say that, oh, it's correlation, and correlation isn't necessarily causation, well, then it's a very easy experiment to do. Stop printing the money. Stop expanding your balance sheet. And let's see what happens with real estate prices. Let's see what happens with the S&P 500, with the NASDAQ, with the Dow Jones Industrial Average, etc., etc. Very easy experiment. Let's, let's give it a shot. But they don't want to do that because they know exactly what they're doing and what would happen. So we will focus closely on real estate in the not-too-distant future. 
Mining added 6,000 jobs in August, reflecting a gain in support activities for mining up 4,000. Mining employment has risen by 55,000 since a trough in August of 2020, but is 96,000 below a peak in January of 2019. So still a ways to go in mining. Employment in retail trade declined by 29,000 in August, with losses in food and beverage stores down 23,000, and in building material and garden supply stores down 13,000. Retail trade employment is down by 285,000 since February of 2020. That's because all of the non-essential small businesses were shut down. If you're a big box store, you're essential. It's death by a thousand cuts, folks. It's plain as day. It's in the data. You're seeing it all over the place. This is what they intended to do. And they're getting away with it. In August, employment in leisure and hospitality was unchanged after increasing by an average of 350000 per month over the prior six months. In August, a job gain in arts, entertainment, and recreation up 36,000 was more than offset by a loss in food services and drinking places down 42,000. I mean, people were, of course, in a hurry to get out for the spring and summer months once things started to open up. And look where we're going. We're going back. We're going back and we're losing jobs in food services and drinking places down 42,000. Leisure and hospitality unchanged, starting to stagnate. People wanted to get out of the house. We understood this. People called it pent-up demand. I didn't call it pent-up demand. It was just it was just delayed. That's all it was. They still people still would have traditionally gone on vacation. They just couldn't go. So there was just a big rush at the same time. And then as I stated at the top of the podcast, savings rates, stimulus checks, everything going away. Well, it all makes sense, doesn't it? Why things are stagnating. Big rush to get back to normal, to go out with your friends, family, whatever, have vacations, do a little traveling. Everybody wanted to do it. But now, well, you still have constraints. You still have your own restrictions. Are you working? You still have debts? Can you pay those off? Are you concerned about losing your job? The prices of everything else that you have to pay for, your rent, housing, utilities, your food, puts a damper on all of this miraculous economic recovery, doesn't it? And that's why the geniuses in Walsh, or excuse me, in Washington are talking about perhaps distributing a fourth stimulus check because the writing's on the wall. There is no economy. This is the greatest depression. And we're still in the early innings, unfortunately. In August, employment showed little change in other major industries, including construction, wholesale trade, and health care. Average hourly earnings for all employees on private non-farm payrolls rose by $0.17 cents to $30.73 in August, following increases in the prior four months. In August, average hourly earnings of private sector production and non-supervisory employees rose by $0.14 cents to $25.99. The data for recent months suggests that the rising demand for labor associated with the recovery from the pandemic may have put upward pressure on wages. Oh boy, all of those people who were fussing about, oh, this isn't an inflationary environment. This isn't a stagflationary environment. Oh, no, no, no. The last thing they were clinging to was wages. Well, they're up a little bit here, aren't they? Now, of course, we'll see how this is sustained. This isn't uh, my bread and butter for this argument. I have a hundred other variables that I discuss and talk about as to why this is an inflationary and stagflationary environment. This is just the one that a lot of those who are against that argument will point to. Now, on a real basis, they could still have an argument because inflation is eating into all of this and there's really not that much growth. But I don't stand on this and this alone. I look at the bigger picture. But nonetheless, this is something that now is starting to eat into those who are in the anti-inflation, anti-stagflation or pro-deflationary camp. However, because average hourly earnings vary widely across industries, the large employment fluctuations since February 2020 complicate the analysis of recent trends in average hourly earnings. In August, the average work week for all employees on private non-farm payrolls was 34.7 hours for the third consecutive month. Now, you would think if we were in a very robust recovery, this number would be trending higher and higher and higher. It's been stagnant for the past few months. In manufacturing, the average work week fell by 0.2 hours over the month to 40.3 hours, and overtime remained at 3.2 hours. The average work week for production and non-supervisory employees on private 
non-farm payrolls was unchanged at 34.2 hours. The change in total non-farm payroll employment for June was revised up by 24,000 from 938,000 to a positive 962,000. And the change for July was revised up by 110,000 from 943,000 to 1,053,000. Quite the revision. With these revisions, employment in June and July combined is 134,000 higher than previously reported. And of course, reading the fine print, they say, well, the employment rate would actually be, or the unemployment rate would actually be 5.5% as opposed to 5.2%. But they even say within their classification error that they're probably overstating that as well. So, I mean, it's basically the whole thing is just made up. It's just to complete the narrative. It's just to give cover to politicians to continue to spend more money to justify it, to look at a report to say, look, we have to do more. It just gives cover to the Federal Reserve to say, look, we have to do more. Manufacturing's down. There's still 5.2 million people still out of the workforce. We're still well below off where we were from February of 2020. There's still so much work to do. All these homeless camps. And then to, to add to it, well, we have COVID. We have the Delta variant. We have the Mu variant. I mean, we're making our way through the Greek alphabet here. I mean, what happens when we get to Omega? I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to come up with, are we going to go back to Alpha 1, Alpha 2? I mean, what are they going to come up with after this? Well, of course, it'll be the climate. If we're not in war by then, because of the Afghanistan debacle, because of geopolitical risks all over the place, because China pulling the strings and putting pressure on other countries, might they try to do something to distract or try to get away with it because the United States is, is we're a quagmire over here. We're a joke. Now, China is too. But hey, that's when you could take advantage of things in the chaos. It's one banana republic after the next, one dismal economic report after the next, unfortunately. And if you're paying attention to Wall Street analysts' expectations of some of these big banks, if you're paying attention to various federal reserves, because there are districts across the country, so if you look at the New York Fed, if you look at the Atlanta Fed, they are starting to revise their GDP numbers. And not by a little bit. I mean, they are slashing their forecast by some 30%. Okay, that is not minor. These are big drops. No, no, no. I thought we were in the biggest recovery ever. I thought we were out of the recession. Things are only supposed to get better from here. And yet you have major Wall Street banks and various Federal Reserve banks across the country slashing their GDP forecasts. And I think there's one uh, Federal Reserve Bank. It might have been New York. I can't remember. But I know there was one of them that just, they're just done. They're, they're not even going to forecast anymore. That's their job. That's their job is to forecast. Whether they're right or wrong, and you can joke about the weatherman and economists, but that's their job to forecast. Oh, we, we, we have no idea what the hell is going on around here, so we're just not going to do it. Not going to do it. And that might actually be the smartest thing they've ever come up with, that they've ever said. We don't know what we're doing. So we're just not even going to try. At least there's some honesty in that. So it's good to be back. Thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for sticking with the Capitol News. But again, the silver lining in all of this, being away for a month and a half, I, I, I try to do my best to equip you with the data, with the information, with the analysis. So what has taken place over the month and a half should not be a surprise to anybody. But if it was, send me an email, send me a message, send me a note. You have some interesting information on something you want me to discuss to the audience? Send me an email. Send me a note. I'll be happy to discuss it. Good to be back. Enjoy your Labor Day weekend, and I hope you hear from me again very soon. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.